So hello everyone, uh, welcome to the session on parametric VAR, uh, the only session that you will ever need. And uh, yeah, the session will be around uh, one hour or so. And I promise uh, that if you stick to the end, um, I will make it uh, worthwhile for you. Yeah, so please stick, uh, stick till the end. Uh, there are a lot of uh, very, very important foundational topics that we'll touch upon uh, that, uh, you know, if you master those topics, calculating value at risk, at least parametric VAR will not be, you know, at all scary or difficult for you. It'll flow naturally. So, so yeah, I mean, um, next one hour, <clears throat> I need your undivided attention and I'll make it worthwhile for you. All right. Okay. Before we get started, um, quick introduction about me for those who don't know me. So my name is Satya. I am a IIT IM graduate. Uh, I have close to 12 years of experience in risk and capital markets. Uh, Karansar and I are partners in Peaks to Tails. So in Peaks to Tails, I have taught um, several uh, topics. Actually, let me take you to the portal. So I have taught uh, uh, bootcamp in quant finance and then machine learning for finance. Uh, there is a few more, few more lectures remaining there. So if you see quant finance, uh, this is a complete course and FDP, finance data professional, which is essentially machine learning for finance. And then the one that is currently ongoing is market risk and counterparty credit risk. So in market risk and counterparty credit risk, uh, I just completed uh, Python primer. So all the basic Python <coughs> coding skills that you need, not just for market risk, but uh, you know, for any kind of uh, analytics or quant profile, these are like the basic Python um, skills that you need. So this is complete. And also we, uh, I covered a few uh, dedicated topics uh, related to stats. So regression, time series, probability, uh, you know, uh, things like that uh, in Python. So that's completed. Uh, just checking, uh, are you guys able to hear me properly? Yes, all right, thanks. Thanks for confirming. Okay, uh, if you are having some trouble, please uh, check your sound settings. All right, so this is completed. And then uh, under foundations, so we have, you know, foundational topic on market risk. So today's session will be sort of, uh, you know, combining these two topics, expectation and variance algebra and Taylor series and sensitivities and how, you know, knowledge of these are crucial to calculate value at risk. Nobody actually tells you these things out in the open, okay? These things are there, but you know, textbooks really don't do a very good job in terms of telling you uh, step by step, you know, uh, the calculations that that lead to that formula for value at risk. We are just given ready-made formulas. Uh, I have done FRM, right? Everywhere in textbooks, we see formulas and formulas, and we just apply that, right? You don't have to do that, right? So today we'll see how you know knowledge of these topics, uh, you know, makes your life so easy, not just for value at risk. Some of these topics that we'll touch upon today are fundamental in, in uh, all of quant finance, okay? All right, and then we uh, just finished the um, uh, FRTV standardized approach that we just completed. Uh, so all of these, are, you know, videos are available and if you go to the class notes, you can download the notes. There are Excel files as well, um, wherever needed. And we just started internal models approach Right, that is the advanced approach for market risk, and we uh, started with one theoretical topic. But if you guys are thinking of enrolling in the course, uh, this will be a good, good point to um, get registered because we are starting a new topic, which is internal models approach, and then we'll be doing some serious coding um, uh, in the you know upcoming weeks. So if you are thinking of enrolling, this is a good time. All right. <clears throat> So let's proceed. So that's uh, about me and the course. And the topic for today, which is parametric VAR, it, it is actually one of the foundational topic in uh, risk calculations because we use value at risk everywhere. But only recently regulators have shifted from value at risk to expected shortfall in market risk, okay? But in order to understand the expected shortfall, you need to first understand value at risk thoroughly because expected shortfall builds on top of value at risk. And uh, you know, it's important to understand the merits and demerits and of risk measures and all that. 
Okay, so today we are touching upon a very specific topic, which is parametric var. Now, this is elegant uh, because pretty much everything is in cold, closed form. Everything is formula based, right? But in order to fully appreciate the formula, you need to understand the underlying uh, key ideas that are so beautifully interconnected, right? And uh, that lead to this formula. Okay. All right, so let's begin. <clears throat> Before we get in the topic, just a few formalities. Uh, why market risk is important. Um, by the way, if you don't know, the latest standard for market risk is FRTV, Fundamental uh, Review of Trading Book. <clears throat> if you, so I, I um, <clears throat> did a LinkedIn search for market risk jobs uh, in India yesterday, and these were the results. I mean, I don't have to justify if, you know, why market risk is important today. So there are close to 3,000 results in market risk, open positions in market risk, <clears throat> right? And yeah, oh, you can see all the top brands uh, are there. And if you just search FRTV, there are 70 results, okay? FRTV is such a hot topic today because banks have to be compliant, uh, right? So it's already delayed and banks are struggling to comply to FRTV standards. And all these market risk uh, positions that you see, even if they don't uh, mention FRTV, Directly, indirectly, they expect you to be familiar with the latest market risk uh, standard. Okay, so in our course, we do uh, an end-to-end -end study of the FRTV regulation, and we uh, do theory, we do examples, calculations in Excel, in Python. So yeah, it's a complete end-to-end -end, uh, coverage of FRTV. Okay, so this is the scene in India, right? And if you are thinking of uh, abroad, <clears throat> just in the United States, so I am based out of US. Um, see, there are 18, close to 17,000 open positions in market risk. And if you type FRTB, you get uh, 60 results. But, but yeah, as I said, right, uh, all of these you know, market risk profiles require you to pretty much know the latest standard. So, so that's the scene, right? That's the job scene. I don't have to tell you that market risk is a hot, uh, it is hot in, in job market. So, um, yeah, I mean, if if you <clears throat> want to build a career in market risk, then you have to know FRTV, you have to know Python. Um, and uh, before, you know, uh, even before you learn FRTV, there is there are fundamental topics that you need to master. Because see, today the regulation is something, tomorrow some other regulation come. And how would you cope, right? So that's why I keep stressing on fundamentals. And today we'll touch upon three different key aspects. And uh, if you are able to understand those three, then you would have no difficulty in terms of, you know, uh, deriving equations or understanding the formulas naturally. Um, you, there are some folks in this uh, session today who are part of my, um, uh, part of the market risk uh, group. You can ask them, I have actually derived the FRTV equations. Uh, for his capital, using the premise um, of, the, of the, the the key fundamental topics that I uh, I'll talk about today. So, using that as a starting point, I have actually derived those formulas. Okay, all right. So let's proceed. It's a very short uh, session to do justice to all the topics. So I'll be speeding up a little bit. But if you have you know questions, definitely you can uh, reach out to us, Karan sir or me. We'll be able to uh, help you out. Okay, so brief background of value at risk. Uh, it was the gold standard of risk. Today also it is, uh, I mean, we are not using value at risk, we are using expected shortfall because of sh uh, some shortcomings, but for many, many years, value at risk was the gold standard of risk, right? What is value at risk? <clears throat> so basically, let's say today your uh, value of a portfolio is $100. And then you're thinking tomorrow, the what the value of portfolio will be. And it is a random variable, right? We don't know what we don't know what the value of the portfolio will be tomorrow. It could be a portfolio, it could be an instrument. Okay. Today it's hundred dollars. Tomorrow, I don't know. All right. The difference between the value is the PL. If you're thinking of one day, then the difference between V1 and V0 is delta V, which is the PL, one day PL. All right. Now, it could be a profit, it could be a loss, but we don't know. Standing at, at t equal to zero, this is a random variable. All right? So what do we do? 
you know, as banks, banks are responsible institutions, right? If there is going to be a PNL, then I have to prepare for it, right? But uh, so in order to prepare, what I need is to, um, you know, have some estimate of the loss so that I can keep an, enough capital to absorb that loss. That's the whole idea, right? If there is a PNL that's going to happen tomorrow, I need to prepare myself. So how do we prepare myself? Well, if somebody gives me the distribution of PNL, right? Then I can make something. I can estimate something. So to make life simple, we actually are thinking of a distribution of PNL. So on the x-axis, you can see there are PNL figures. Zero in the middle. Here we have profit, $10, $20. And here we have loss on the left side. And each of these loss is associated with a probability. Okay, so if we treat this as continuous, then it's a there is a probability density associated with each and every PNL figure. Okay. All right. Now, if we know the distribution of one day PNL, what we can do is obviously this uh, PNL distribution it, it's random, right? But our, the capital that we want to keep that cannot be random. Okay, it has to be one some formula based. Uh, you know, capital that I need to keep to ensure that for the most part, I'm covered. Okay, so that that is doable. So once I have the distribution, I can probably choose an extreme loss, right? Such that 95% of the time, my loss will not exceed that amount. Or we can say only 5% of the time, the actual loss will exceed that amount. If I keep capital equal to this particular value, then 95% of the time I am covered. I will remain solvent. That's the whole idea. Okay. And um, most of you will probably are aware of this um, concept. So that's the definition of value at risk. So, the, so for example, let's say it is uh, in, in our scenario, it is $20. So we'll say one day, 95% value at risk is $20, right? What does that mean? Remember, please remember, on the x-axis, we have delta V, which is PNL, okay? And this is the distribution. What does this mean? One day, 95% value at risk, which is $20. It means that there is only 5% chance that the loss will exceed $20. We can also reinterpret this as there is 95% chance that losses will be less than $20. Okay, two interpretations. And for all intents and purposes, I mean, it's, it's a default um, choice, right? So we statisticians, first of all, if there is some random variable, we, we typically start, uh, assume that as normal. Okay, so we, we will assume that PNL follows normal distribution. Um, okay, if I now if it if it follows normal distribution, then I can find out the quantile if this the cumulative probability distribution is five percent. I can find the quant this quantile this particular value. There is a ready-made formula for that if it follows normal distribution, right? And so that is uh, so. Let's say I, we know that if x follows normal distribution with mean mu and variance sigma square then at 5% quantile, how do you find the value of x? Simple formula, mu plus sigma z. Mu plus sigma z. And z, you can find by inverting the CDF, correct? N inverse 5%. That's how you find the loss figure, all right? So this is, uh, in general, we know, right? x equal to mu plus sigma z. If we have a distribution for the PNL, if PNL follows normal distribution with mean mu variance sigma square, then value at risk at 5%, it's the same quantile, right? That's mu plus sigma z. Okay. All right. So this is our target at the end, end of the exercise. Whatever we do at the end of the exercise, we finally need the distribution of PNL. Once we have the access to the distribution of PNL, then we have access to mu and sigma of the PNL. We just apply this formula. That's value at risk. All right. By the way, remember n inverse 5% will be a negative number. 
okay minus 1.645 so far so good i hope uh, if you have any questions let me know but this is our uh, target this is where we we want uh, to go okay all right let's proceed now probably for a single instrument it is very easy to calculate value at risk what happens uh, in typically in, in a trading book right there are hundreds and thousands of different types of instruments right if you look at a portfolio we have stocks stock options swaps foreign stocks foreign bonds caps floors all kinds of instruments right how do we calculate value at risk of this portfolio that's the question okay now i know in textbooks you are thrown formulas after formulas and uh, you just blindly you know apply that formula without truly appreciating how that formula came into being so to, today the, the agenda is to you know come up with systematic steps and connect the dots between various key concepts that will lead us to that formula okay that's the agenda all right so when you have a portfolio we, we do all kinds of things uh, like how to how to calculate parametric var of the portfolio how to incorporate sensitivities such as delta duration gamma all those things right if you have calculated the value at risk for an option then you must have used delta sometimes we call delta normal delta normal var right how do we actually actually what's what's the how that formula came into being okay we'll we'll just we'll talk about all of those sometimes correlation comes into picture how do we incorporate correlations <clears throat> how does scaling work when we go from one day value at risk to let's say 10 day value at risk we multiply a square root of 10 how does that come into picture okay all of these things right actually boils down to understanding three important concepts so we'll talk about that <clears throat> when do we take percentage return versus when do we take absolute changes okay when we talk about stock portfolio we take percentage returns or relative returns when we talk about yield bond yield there we take change in yield not percentage returns and there are reasons for everything okay so we'll we'll see that now the whole exercise seems very scary because all of these things you know uh, come into picture and we don't know exactly how to systematically approach this problem however as i promised right you all you need to know is three things three things properties of normal distribution and we pretty much know this but we'll just touch upon briefly okay there are two things that you need to know we need to know taylor series and i cannot stress you enough how important taylor series is okay uh, if you do a deep dive study of taylor series it will take a couple of classes but today i'll give you a high level flavor that will uh, be sufficient for now okay you need to know taylor series taylor series is the holy grail of market risk without taylor series you cannot even think of uh doing anything in market risk and if you master taylor series there is a topic called stochastic calculus which is used heavily for pricing of derivatives and stochastic calculus has this uh, famous uh, uh result called uh, ito's lemma right if you have heard of it uh and believe me or not if you master taylor series you can derive ito's lemma you don't need to remember ito's lemma it follows naturally from taylor series in all of quant finance right taylor series is is paramount it's extremely important and then we have uh two very cute theorems around expectation and variance algebra lot of you i have seen struggle with this because there was i think no textbook seriously has explained the two simple theorems that relate to expectation and variance algebra so we keep you know memorizing different formulas and you know memory uh, memorization does not scale well with human beings right we are not robots we cannot memorize 100 different things so we need to understand fundamentals all right okay so if you master these three things then value at risk becomes re really easy right you can tell parametric var bring it on okay so we'll what we'll do is we'll look at these three topics at a very high level do we, we'll do some small toy examples and then we'll get to calculation of value at risk 
Okay, first topic, properties of normal distribution. We know this. Uh, first of all, you need to know how to seamlessly go from Z to X to CDF. Okay, this should be clear in your mind and I'm pretty sure probably 95% of you already know this clearly, but nevertheless. So if you have a normal distribution and then uh, there is some probability alpha, right? That's the CDF, cumulative distribution function. You can calculate the Z value here and also the X value here. So the Z is given by inverting the probability N inverse alpha. And the X is given by mu plus sigma Z. Never forget this formula, this is very easy. Z is standard normal, X is that original normal distribution which has mu and sigma, right? The mean of Z is zero and the variance is one. So X is mu plus sigma Z, you just plug in uh, Z here and inverse alpha. That's all, okay? This is a relation um, you know, that, that links X and alpha. And you also, you know, you can, you, you know, the relation between alpha and Z. Why this is needed? This is needed at the end. When you have the PNL distribution, you have identified what is the mu of the PNL and sigma of the PNL. We need to calculate value at risk, right? By leaving, let's say, 5% or 1% in the tail area. So this formula will help us give, uh, arrive at that loss figure. Okay. All right. For example, if alpha is 5%, then n inverse alpha is minus 1.645. So your x becomes mu minus sigma times 1.645. If alpha is 1%, then we have uh, n inverse 1% is two, minus 2.33. So we get this formula. Okay, this, this is probably you know, known to everyone. Next, um, yeah, so as I mentioned, right, we need to apply this formula on the PNL distribution of the portfolio to arrive at parametric value at risk. Why do we call it parametric, by the way? Because there are parameters. Mu and sigma are the parameters. We impose normal distribution on the PNL. Normal distribution is fully defined if you define two parameters, mu and sigma. Based on those parameters, we arrive at value at risk. That's why it is called parametric value at risk. Okay, the next thing you need to know is a very, very powerful, simple and powerful result that uh, we often you know, fail to realize. But this is ex you know, extremely powerful. Linear combination of two normal randoms is another normal random. What do I mean is, um, if you take one normal distribution and scale it up, multiply it by A or whatever. Another normal distribution, multiply B, so A times one normal distribution plus B times another normal distribution results in another normal distribution. On the left-hand side, we have a linear combination. Okay, linear combination will be of this form. Some constant times random variable plus or minus another constant times another normal random variable. The resultant is another new normal random variable always remember this extremely powerful okay these are the two things you need to know that's all any questions okay can i proceed so question is what does line linear means in linear operations, you can do only two things, plus minus, I consider plus minus as one. I mean, you can do plus or minus. Second thing is you can scale. Here I'm doing a scaling, multiply by any constant, two, three, four, minus five, 33, whatever you want, plus or minus, another constant times. So these two are random variables. X is a normal random. Y is another normal random. You can scale those and add or subtract. That's the linear combination, all right? And the final answer, the resulting random uh, variable would be also normally distributed. Question is how this formula got derived? Well, you need to know a few um, advanced topics such as moment generating function, MGF, PGF, et cetera. It's, uh, it's 
it's a little advanced. So let's not get into that. But if you want, I can give you a link. Uh, um, yeah, it's actual maths stuff. So let's let's not get into that. But let's use use this result. Okay, remember this. Um, all right. So um, let's let's build on this. Right. So now we discuss properties of normal distribution. These formulas will come in handy later. So bear with me. Okay. Did you understand these two uh, um, formulas? This this is the result, and this you probably already know. Okay, let let's proceed. Next topic: expectation and variance algebra. This is the most underrated topic because it is there, it is there everywhere, but nobody mentions it properly in textbooks. Okay, so if you understand expectation and variance algebra, th there are numerous questions in uh, regression and time series that actually use these uh, simple theorems, but nobody tells you those. Sometimes you know, I mean, there are lot, lots of questions that I see, right? Uh, find out the variance of Y in an AR2 process or a conditional expectation of Y in an AR1 process, given this, that, correlation, all that. And uh, you end up memorizing 10 different formulas. It is not worth it, guys. You just need to remember two things. Okay. So pay attention because this is where I've seen most of you struggle. Expect there are there is one formula for expectation. Expectation algebra, right? Expectation is a linear operator. What does that mean? It means if you <clears throat> if you take a linear combination of two variables, x is a random variable, y is a random variable. Ax plus minus by, this is a linear combination, right? Only scaling is involved and addition or subtraction. That's a linear combination. This will result in a new random variable because it's a linear combination of two random variables. Whatever that new random variable is, expectation or mean of that random variable is simply given as the linear, same linear combination of individual expectations. That's all. That's why you call expectation is a linear operator because this E can go inside. E, you can put E here, E here. That's the uh, result here. Okay. So you can remember like this expectation of a linear combination of random variables is a linear combination of expectations of each of the random variables. Okay. Keep the sign intact. If it is plus, keep plus. If it is minus, keep minus. Otherwise, you know, you can take E inside. All right, let's do some examples, quick examples. Let's say X is normal, mean two, variance nine. Y is also normal, mean one, variance four. What is expectation of X plus Y, quickly? Expectation of X plus Y. Please participate. It is it is today or never, guys. Trust me. <laughs> okay. Yeah. So all of you are saying uh, three is pretty straightforward, right? Expectation of x plus y is expectation of x plus expectation of y. So it is two plus one. That is three. Expectation of x minus y. X minus y. One straightforward. Two minus one. That's one. Expectation of 2x plus 3y. Now, this is a you know linear combination, full-fledged linear combination. What is the answer for this? Seven, right? Straightforward. Two times two, four, plus three times one, three, four plus three, seven. Perfect. What about this one? Expectation of three plus three x minus two y. This is also seven, is it? Three times two, six plus three, nine minus two, that is seven. So expectation of a constant is that constant. Okay, there is no variation, right? So if this is always three, then on an average, it is also three, right? So expectation of three is three. What about this one? I think 20% of you will do a mistake.
Till now, 100% of you have uh, made mistakes. <laughs> you can find the answer, not right now. With this infrastructure, you cannot because X times Y is not a linear combination. Do not take E inside. No, no, it's not undefined. You can calculate this. You just need to know the correlation between uh, these two. You can apply co covariance formula. You can actually find out this, but please, please, please do not write this as expectation of X times expectation of Y. Don't do that. X times Y is a product of two random variables. This is not a linear combination. This is not a linear combination, okay? Okay, so answer is not uh, two times one. So don't do that. Okay, that's all there is for expectation. That's what you need to know. Next, variance algebra, you must have uh, seen this already, but let's do this. Here also people struggle. First of all, variance is not a linear operator, all right? Because it is given as this. So if you take variance of AX plus minus BY, you actually get, so this constant when they come out will be squared. A square variance of X plus, irrespective of what sign you have here, the second term is always plus because you're taking variance, right? Variance is always positive. Plus B square variance of Y. And then depending on whether you have plus or minus, you retain that sign over here. That's plus minus uh, two AB covariance of X and Y. Okay, by no means it is a linear combination. If it had been a linear combination, the formula would have been Variance of this is A times variance of X plus minus B times variance of Y. That is not, not the case. It's a completely different formula, right? It's not a linear operator. Please remember this. You can also simplify this to covariance of X, X and Y is given as correlation rho between X and Y times standard deviation of X times standard deviation of Y. Okay, this is covariance. All right. And if you want the uh, sigma, the standard deviation of this linear combination, you already know the variance. So you take a square root. Standard deviation is the square root of variance. That's all. Okay. Let's do some quick examples. Same example, same two random variables. X is normal, Y is normal. And there is, let's assume there is no correlation. That means rho is zero. Okay. What is uh, variance of X plus Y? How did you get 97? Or was that a printing mistake? What is variance of X plus Y, guys? Take your time. By the way, please remember when we write this notation, X is normal with mean two variance nine. This is variance. This is not standard deviation. Okay. The notation is X is normal with mean mu variance or sigma square is nine. Variance is nine. Variance is four. Okay. Now all of you are getting correct answer. So yeah. So it's variance of X plus variance of Y. That's all. There is no A, B, A is one, B is one. It's variance of X plus variance of Y. There is no correlation. So nine plus four, 13, correct. What about this one, X minus Y? I knew 50% of you will get it wrong. That's so hence today's agenda, right? Simple, simple concepts, but underrated. And that's why you guys struggle. Variance of X minus Y. Look at the formula here. <clears throat> it is still 13, right? Variance of X plus variance of Y plus variance of Y. All right, that is also 13. What about this one? Try to do it in your head. I actually don't need a piece of paper or Excel.
<clears throat> Most of you are saying 30. How did you get 30? All of you are wrong till now. <laughs> Be careful, guys. Look at this formula again. A is 2, but it comes out as A square. B square. Okay? So 4 times 9, that's 36, plus 9 times 4, that is also 36. 36 plus 36, we get 72. Okay. I cannot imagine, guys, if, I mean, if seriously, if you are not comfortable with this formula yet, how much pain and trouble you must be facing on a daily basis? Seriously. So, yeah, again, fundamentals, highly underrated. Master these and you'll have, you know, your life will be really easy. Okay. Never underestimate fundamentals. All right, I hope you are clear with this. Any questions? Let's solve uh, quickly three more examples uh, and then we'll go to the next topic. Same uh, example, but now the correlation, this is not, there was no correlation. Now the correlation is 0.5, okay? Same questions. So I'll give you, uh, let me refresh your memory. This was uh, 13, right? Nine plus four, 13. So now there will be one extra term, this one. So what is this now? <clears throat> 13 plus... How do you get 14, guys? See the variations in, the, in your answer. Isn't it uh, amazing? Okay. We have 13, right? The first part is 13. Then we have a plus. I purposefully gave 0.5 because when you do two times row, two times row, that's two times 0.5 is one. So you can completely forget two and row. It's just A, B, and product of standard deviations. A and B are one. Standard deviations are not nine and four. Standard deviations are three and two. So it's six. Okay, so 13 plus six, 19. Yes. What about the next one? It will be 7. 30, it was 13 plus 6 in this case. Only different uh, is that we need to take minus. So 13 minus 6, 7. Perfect. And the last one. This requires some calculus. So uh, let me refresh your memory. This was 72. And then you do the last term. Seventy-two minus yeah. So A and B are six. A times B is six. Six times three and two that is six. So th uh, thirty-six. Seventy-two minus thirty-six that is thirty-six. That is correct. So thirty-six is a good number. If somebody asks you what is the standard deviation of two x minus three y, then square root of thirty-six that is six. All right. This is, that's all there is in expectation and variance. Only two formulas, right? It's not that difficult. Just you need to be careful. That's all. Okay. So we are through with two topics. Now the final topic, which is Taylor series. Okay. Taylor series might seem complicated, might seem little off-putting for you guys who uh, do not like calculus. Uh, but trust me, you, at some point in time, you have to love calculus. Otherwise. I'm not saying solve uh, Olympiad questions on integration differentiation, not needed. 
understand calculus basics at least simple functions that you need to be able to calculate uh, you know the derivatives and integration don't think that you can escape calculus all your life and be a quad professional that that is an oxymoron right? it doesn't work that way you have to um you have to and there are four topics for any quant professional calculus there is uh, when i say calculus it is derivative integration and taylor series okay taylor series is part of calculus so it's calculus there is linear algebra and probability statistics and coding these four things you have to do unless you are in a different profile like accounting or something then please don't bother but if you are want to become a quant professional these are the four skills that you have to master so don't run away okay start doing it things are easy it's not it's not difficult all right last topic okay so before that combine one and two remember in one so one is a normal distribution right we discussed a very powerful theorem which is linear combination of two normals gives you another normal and in the second uh, topic, we learned about expectation variance algebra. Let's put those two together and we can come up with something. So we said that a combination of linear combination of two normals is another normal. So if X is normally distributed, Y is normally distributed. Now we'll mix those two distributions in a linear fashion. And this operation is what we have been doing so far. So here, all of these examples that these are all linear combinations, linear combinations, linear combinations. Okay. The, the final uh, distribution, which is a linear combination, AX plus BY, right? That is what how we have mixed these two distributions, A times X plus B times Y, AX plus BY is a new random variable, but we know two things. One is it has to be normal because from the properties of normal distribution, we know linear combination is a normal distribution. So it will be normal. When you say normal distribution, you only need two things, mu and sigma. Once you know mu and sigma, the whole distribution is defined. Okay, two parameters. We need to find out these, these guys, and then we know the whole distribution. In order to find this, we use expectation algebra because there are two random variables expectation algebra will give you the answer for this one because that's the uh, so we want to know the expectation of this linear combination right and to know this one we use variance algebra that we learned that's it all of these linear combinations that we discussed in the last uh, slide they result in a normal distribution and we cal can calculate the expectation we can calculate the variance hence we know the complete distribution of the linear combination. All right, that's all. There is one uh, challenging question for you. Spend one minute on this. Um, yeah, so if Z1 and Z2 are two uncorrelated standard normals, Z1 and Z2 are two uncorrelated standard normals, what is the probability that 2Z1 is less than Z2? I asked this question because this was asked uh, to one of my friends who appeared uh, in a senior position in one of the top investment banks in market risk role. So how can we calculate this? Any ideas? Okay, let me proceed. This on, on the face of it might look difficult, but we can do a variable transformation. We need to find out this, right? This is the question, which alternatively means 2z1 minus z2 must be less than zero. Same thing, correct? We just took it to the left side. The moment you see this, the moment you see this, the, your alarm bell should uh, go off because this is nothing but a linear combination. There are normal distributions and they are being linearly combined. Okay, normal. so yeah, that's a linear combination. And we know for a fact that 
a linear combination of two normal distributions is another normal distribution. So let's do one thing. Let's take x as this guy, right? And we know x will be normal distribution. Question is, what is the probability that x is less than zero? That is the question. Okay. We can do two things. We can so uh, three things to do. One is first of all, we know x is a x will be normally distributed, right? Second thing, we can find out the expectation of x using expectation algebra. What is the expectation of x? Two times expectation of z1 minus expectation of z2. Since these are all standard normals, so everything is zero, we get zero, right? What is the variance of x? Well, variance algebra, two square, that is four, variance of z1 plus, don't do minus here, Okay, variance of z2 because there is, the coefficient is one, right? The variance of standard normal is one. So we get four plus one, that is five. And that's it. So we have the complete distribution of x. x is a normal distribution, uh, x follows normal distribution with mean zero, variance five. What is the probability that x is less than zero? All of you, x follows normal distribution. X has a mean, x is centered at zero and it is normally distributed. Variance actually does not matter in this question, irrespective of variance. What is the probability that x is less than zero? 50, 50, right? 50 on left side, 50 on right side. Normal distribution is symmetric. The mean is zero. Whatever is the variance does not matter. The probability of x less than zero is 0.5. All right. <clears throat> so this is one application. Okay. So we are through with two topics. Now one more topic. Please bear with me. Um, yeah. Next topic is Taylor series. Now this will involve some derivatives. Please don't get scared. Simple derivatives. You have to, you know, do this at one point of time. You cannot escape. Taylor series forever. So please pay attention. I'll try to make it as easy for you as possible. Okay, what does Taylor series uh, do actually? It does a simple thing. So when you have a function, okay, there is an output and there are inputs. There could be one input, there could be multiple inputs. It links, Taylor series links changes in input or changes in X to changes in output which is why through sensitivities, changes in output are linked to changes in input through sensitivities. That equation is, uh, comes from Taylor series expansion. All right, let's look at some examples. So this, this is a theory. So if y is a function of x, so x is input, y is output. If x changes by delta x, then how much y changes? That, that answer is given by Taylor series. The answer is this. Change in y is related to change in x through the slope. And this is the derivative of y with respect to x. Also, you can think of this as the sensitivity. Sensitivity of y with respect to x. So this is change in output. And that's change in input. How these are linked through the derivative or the slope or the sensitivity. This formula is given by uh, Taylor series, uh, actually Taylor series does not stop here. Taylor series is a whole, you know, there are infinite terms in the expansion. This is only the first order term, okay? This part. And then you can keep including a higher order derivatives, okay? So the second term is half double derivative, delta x square, okay? This term uh, comes from square of change in input. Similarly, if you continue, you'll get all the higher order terms. Okay, so for all practi you know, practical purposes, typically we limit ourselves to the second order term. In our session today, we'll even ignore this. We'll just work with the delta. Uh, sorry, I brought up that word, but you guys probably know this. The first derivative is called delta. The second one is called gamma. This is in finance. Okay, in just plain vanilla maths, we call this first order derivative. The second order derivative. 
in finance we'll call this as delta second one is called gamma sometimes it is also called as convexity in option literature this is gamma in bond literature this is convexity and in bond this actually becomes duration not exactly but we'll we'll see that later okay so this is this comes naturally from taylor series expansion um okay all right so uh so yeah, I mean, I was exp uh, explaining that from now on, we'll just ignore uh, all the higher order terms. We'll just work with our first order derivative, only this much. In quant finance, the second order derivative actually becomes the star of the show. If you look at stochastic calculus or eto calculus, this term cannot be ignored. It is significant, okay? But anyways, that's for another topic, another day. So from now on, we'll just use the approximate uh, relationship. Okay, change in y is related to change in x through the derivative, first order derivative uh, or slope or sensitivity. Now let's do some examples, simple examples, okay? Now this is univariate expansion because there is only one input, one x. Next we'll look at multivariate. One example, y equal to x square, simple function. We need to link delta x with delta y we need to link delta x with delta y. if x changes by a little bit delta x how much does y change but first of all you have to find out the derivative what is derivative of y with respect to x it's 2x simple and then we have our formula delta y is 2x times delta x if i give you the change in uh, x uh, as you know some some value you can readily calculate the change in value in y for this function, okay? All right, next example, y equal to log x, derivative of y is one by x. If you have forgotten the derivative, it's fine. You can always go back and you know uh, recall, but these are simple functions. And then we just plug in the derivative here. Delta y is uh, one by x, delta x. Another example, y equal to e to the power x. Derivative of y is again same e to the power x. And we just plug it uh, here. So delta y is e to the power x times delta x. How do we use this in practice? I'll give you a very simple application. Approximate e to the power 0.1. Approximate e to the power 0.1 without using calculator. How do we do this? There is one value that we know which do not require a calculator, which is e to the power 0. We know e to the power 0 is 1. We know e to the power 0 is 1. Anything to the power 0 is 1, correct? If we know e to the power 0 is 1, from 0, it has the input, which, is, which was 0, has moved a little bit by 0.1. That's delta x. If it moved a little bit, how much y, which is e to the power x, would change. We can calculate that using Taylor series, right? So let's do this. This is our function y equal to e to the power x. When x was 0, initially at x equal 0, y was 1, e to the power 0 is 1. x has changed. So this, this is the current values, right? This is what we need to find out. New value of x is 0 0.1. What is the new value of y? which is e to the power point. This is the question, correct? That's what we need to find out. Now see, from x equal to 0 to x as point 0.1, what is the change? Delta x is point 0.1, right? If we can find out delta y, then we are good, correct? And we know how to find out delta y from delta x. This is from Taylor series. Just plug it in. So we got e to the power x was 0 initially times change in x is 0.1. So we get the change in y as 0.1. So y would change by 0.1. All right. What was the original value of y? It was 1. Now y will change by 0.1. So what is the new value of y? 1, 1 plus 0.1. That's 1.1. Perfect. We did not use calculator. We found the value of e to the power 0 0.1 using Taylor series. Okay, you can verify this uh, in Excel. 
you might think, uh, what is the use of Taylor series? This is just a toy example. Yes, idea. I mean, I'm giving you ex simple examples to make sure that you understand the equation properly. The application is immense. I can't even begin to tell you. Um, to show you a more practical finance example, we know that the value of a bond depends on the yield. B, which is the price of the bond, is a function of the yield. Because it is, I mean, you will discount all the coupon payments and principal payment at the end by the prevailing yield that will give you the price of the bond. If the yield changes due to movement in the yield curve, then your discounting factor changes, the price of the bond changes. Okay. The value of the bond is a function of yield. You can, so look at this. This is just a output. This is the input. Yield is the input. Bond price is the output. I can approximate change in bond value when the yield changes a little changes by a little bit correct using taylor series so we proceed like this delta v is first derivative times delta y and if you actually take the present value of all the coupon payments and uh, do uh, the derivative you are, I, you'll actually see that we have a very nice term for this so this comes down as minus B times modified duration. All right. Uh, you can actually prove that if you take an example of a bond, uh, take the derivative and you'll see it comes down as minus B times modified duration. So minus because we have the inverse relationship. And what is modified duration? It is uh, duration divided by one plus Y. Okay. Very simple formula. But uh, don't take this formula as granted. You can actually derive this. Okay. All right. So this is one application of Taylor series. I have ignored the second order term. Uh, if we include that, that's called as convexity. And it will have a delta y whole square term. Okay. But for this uh, session, we are only considering the first order derivatives. So that's Taylor series for univariate. One last thing to do, and then we'll see application. That's it. We almost made it. All right. Just bear with me. One more topic. Taylor series for multivariate functions. So what is multivariate? Multiple inputs. That's all. Your output depends on multiple inputs. If we have this, then we cannot take ordinary derivatives. Right? We need to take partial derivative. All right. Let's see that. Our formula changes a little bit like this. Change in Z, obviously, see, if X changes, Z will change. If Y changes, Z will change. But the changes in Z will be coming from changes of all the inputs. Okay. So let's see. So this is the first order approximation. I have you know, intentionally not written the second or higher order approximations. So this is given as C delta. Now th there are two things to note. One is D has been replaced by del. Okay. Del is called partial derivative. Partial derivative. D is called ordinary derivative. Del is called partial derivative. What's the difference? The difference is very simple. When you are taking partial derivative of Z with respect to X, treat all other variables as constant. Treat all other variables as constant. That's all. There is nothing else in partial derivative. So this is how it goes. Change in Z will be slope or sensitivity with respect to X times change in X plus slope or sensitivity with respect to Y times change in Y. Okay. There are other higher order terms. We are not discussing that, but those become very, very important in stochastic calculus which is important for derivative pricing. Okay, so we are doing market risk, right? Um, yeah, but there are, okay, let's, let's not get into those complications. Uh, today's session is all about simplicity and elegance, right? So let's uh, stick to that. Let's do some quick examples. Multivariate, remember, more than two, uh, sorry, more than one input variable. So we have Z equal to X square Y. In order to use this equation, we need to first find out the partial derivatives. What is del Z by del X? Simple. If you are di differentiating with respect to X, treat Y as constant. This is partial derivative. 
if y is constant, y will come out and derivative of uh, x square is 2x. So we got 2xy. We got 2xy, right? y came out, y is a constant. Derivative of x square with respect to x is 2x. So this is what it is. Similarly, if you want to do partial derivative with respect to y, x square will be constant. x square came out. Derivative of y with respect to y is 1. All right, so uh, we get x square. Okay, yeah, Ankit has a question. Why partial derivative is taken here? Uh, well, you need to, I can explain this using geometry and all to take uh, a lot of time. But in multivariate setting, you need to uh, consider the changes in isolation. Because if you are changing x and if you are changing y together, it's hard to imagine, right? So keep y as constant, only change x, see how much z is changing. Then keep x as constant, only change y, see how much z is changing. And you add those sources of change, two sources of changes together to get the total change. Okay. And this is what you do in regression also. In regression, your y, which is the dependent variable, you rep represent that as a function, linear combination of uh, different x, which are input variables, right? The beta coefficients that you get. So let's say y equal to a plus uh, bx1 plus cx2 plus epsilon. The same kind of treatment you can do to understand if I shock or change one in input variable by keeping all others constant, that's the interpretation. What is the interpretation of a beta coefficient in regression? It is the change in y given one unit. I, I hate that definition, one unit change. But anyways, one unit change in a particular x, keeping all other x as constant. Okay, so that's, uh, if you take partial derivative, you'll get exactly that particular beta. Others will drop off because those are constant. Okay, there is more, more context to this, but for the, in the spirit of today's uh, lecture, let's not get into that, but I'll be happy to discuss more uh, offline. All right, the, okay, continuing this, you can just uh, plug in. So delta Z is um, 2XY times delta X. Right, and then this guy, which is X square times delta Y, that's the expression for total change in Z. Another example, x plus e to the power y. Simple, partial derivative with respect to x would be one because this is a constant. Partial derivative with respect to y is e to the power y because x is a constant. Derivative of constant is zero. All right, we get this and then you can just plug it in. So one times delta x plus e to the power y times delta y. Simple. The most, the classic application of multivariate Taylor series. I can't think of a better example in finance other than our option. Value of, of an option is a function of multiple parameters or variables. There is the, so this is an equity option. There is underlier S. We have interest rate, risk free rate, R. We have the volatility sigma, and then we have the natural pro progression of time, right? With change in time, uh, the value of the option you know changes. There are four variables. Okay, so going uh, with this infrastructure, we can actually estimate or approximate change in value of the option because of change in value of you know any one of these input variables. And that follows naturally like this. Change in value of the option is first order derivative with respect to S, time change in S. First order, uh, so I also included the second order term here because this is important. So half, uh, in the second order term, you actually include a half double derivative, change in uh, um, that variable whole square, correct? Um, I included this because it has a special name and I'm pretty much sure you all of you know this. So this is a first order derivative with respect to S times change in S. First order derivative with respect to sigma times change in sigma. First order derivative with respect to risk-free rate times change in risk-free rate. 
first order derivative with respect to time times change in time. That's the approximation of change in value of the function. All right. And we know these are called Greeks. This is delta. This is gamma, vega, rho, theta. All right. Um, yeah, these are option Greeks. And uh, for our session, we'll only consider the delta approximation. We'll ignore all this. Okay. But these are there. Typically, rho and theta are not that predominant. Vega is very important. And gamma is also important. Okay. In regulatory risk capital calculation, they treat delta, gamma, and vega. For our uh, use case, we'll only consider the delta uh, portion of it. Okay. So this is my approximation of change in value of the function. Uh, if the change, um, uh, given the change in the underlier delta s. All right. That's all. Okay. This is all we need to know. Can you believe? So in parametric value at risk calculation, all these three topics are actually very beautifully convoluted together, but nobody tells you those steps one by one. Today, we'll try to do justice to that. Okay, bear with me for, uh, for 15 more minutes, we should be done. Five steps to compute parametric value at risk. And these five steps are very important because not just you know for uh, toy examples, uh, or, you know, questions that come in your exams, but using this prem uh, premise, you can actually appreciate the formulas that regulators have given uh, in FRTV. Okay. Uh, in the class, I have derived those equations from scratch using the same five steps premise. You can ask the, your friends in the group. Okay. Let's understand this. Step number one. Portfolio value, whatever market, so in your entire trading book portfolio that has lots of instruments, portfolio value is just sum of individual instruments, value of individual instruments. There is no doubt about this. Value of the portfolio is just the sum of the values of individual instruments. That's the first step. It's, it's not a, even a, it's just a trivial mechanical step. You have to begin with this, okay? Just write it, write this equation, that's all. Second equation is also very mechanical change in value of the portfolio is actually change in value plus sum of change in value of the individual instruments that's all how does the portfolio ch value change because of change in value of the individual instruments you add everything together you get the final pnl correct step 1 and step 2 are very very mechanical straightforward step 3 when you see this and we know that an instrument is actually a function of several input variables. We don't call those actually in, as input variables. In risk management, we call those as risk factors. Okay. In option, we had uh, S, the underlier, and sigma are the main uh, risk factors. Correct. So, this change in value of the instrument, you can expand using Taylor series. Each one of these, expand using Taylor series. That's the third step. <clears throat> so uh, replace the change in values of the instruments by Taylor series expansion on relevant risk factors. So let's say a particular instrument is a function of two risk factors, X, Y, just an example. Then using Taylor series, you can expand the change in value of that instrument using this equation, right? Del B by del X times delta X, del E by del Y times delta Y, all right? When you do that for every instrument, there will be some instruments which reference the same risk factors, right? There will be, let's say one, this instrument also is a function of X. This instrument is also a function of X. So if we add all those, this term, if you look at this term, right? If you take Delta X common, the sensitivities of individual instruments will get added up, right? This term will come from one instrument. If another instrument also has a risk factor, the same X risk as risk factor, this has sensitivity to delta, uh, I mean, multiplied by delta X. This also will have some other sensitivity times multiplied by delta X. If you take delta X common, you'll get some of the, the, the sensitivities called as net sensitivities. It's quite natural. You don't have to remember because once you expand everything, 
automatically the sensitivities will get added if you take delta x common okay the entire net sensitivity of the portfolio with respect to x that automatically comes naturally from this expression all right that's the net sensitivity that will come you don't have to you don't have to do any special thing it will come i'll show you in the example and then what do you do then there is one uh, caveat so we'll see this in action right now you'll not understand this if you have equities fx or commodity right if you have equities fx or commodity risk class you have to express this this particular term in terms of percentage returns and if you have rates okay like uh, so if you have instruments like bonds caps floors etc which uh, reference some you know rates like libor ois or whatever then you need to express this as absolute changes in yield delta y remember so that's one thing you have to take care of we will see the those in action and why do we do that is because in these three risk risk classes equities fx commodity the percentage returns or the relative returns is the one that is normally distributed and in case of bonds the change in absolute value of the yield which is delta y that is normally distributed what is our assumption percentage returns on stocks equities sorry stocks fx and commodities are normally distributed in case of bonds the delta y which is change in yield that's normally distributed what i have seen sometimes you know people who don't real, uh, re realize this they'll take interest rate data time series and assume interest rate is normally distributed and calculate value at risk that will be wrong you know you're not supposed to model interest rates itself as normally distributed you need to take take the changes in yield delta y that is normally distributed all right so we'll see this and finally last step if you have done everything correctly you will see that portfolio the end the total portfolio level pnl or delta v will appear as a linear combination of normal randoms and we know for a fact that combination of normal randoms is another normal random and from there we can calculate the mean and variance of the portfolio pn the level pnl and from here you know how to calculate value at risk this is the last step which we covered in the beginning once we get the pnl distribution of the portfolio we know the mu and sigma we can calculate the value at risk it's just one equation right mu plus sigma z that's all all right <clears throat> okay please remember the first two steps are really not steps it's just formality right the main uh, work is here so let's take four examples and then we'll wrap up so moment of truth now time to apply those things that we learned simple example our portfolio has only one stock s just a stock now here you probably have solved value at risk questions many many times right and blindly we take the value of the stock we take the returns we multiply the sigma and do all kinds of things uh it's sometimes it you know it, uh if you are not careful you'll commit mistakes and have we really ever appreciated how that formula came into being well with this you know uh, uh systematic procedure we'll be able to arrive every single formula same five steps no matter how complicated your portfolio is same five steps okay so let's do this first equation value of the portfolio is just is just one instrument right the stock v equal to s next delta v change in value of the portfolio would be this dv by ds delta ds uh, delta s that's taylor series you actually don't need to do this it's a very simple portfolio we know that delta v is equal to delta s that is because the sensitivity would be one what is dv by ds dv by ds is one right don't need to do this but then we are just following the formalities okay change in value of the portfolio which is pnl is linked to change in value of just one single instrument all right now when i said that if you are dealing with equities fx and commodities do not stop here there is one more step you need to express this in terms of returns 
not delta s. We don't model delta s. Delta s, if you want to model, it will be log normal distributed. Who wants that? No, nobody wants that, right? We prefer normal distributions. So we can we don't stop here. We do this. We multiply s, divide by s. This becomes s times this guy. What is this? Change in stock price by original stock price. That is the returns, the relative returns on stock price. Okay. So uh, I mean, uh, uh, bring this expression till this point. Okay. Now we have something very simple. Our assumption is that returns is normally distributed. Return this R is a normal random. For risk management purpose, we typically assume the mean is zero. Even if, I mean, empirically, if you take a time series and see the expected value, it will come as positive. Supposed to be positive, stock is supposed to give you some returns, right? But for risk management, we typically remain conservative. So we can assume that as zero. And if we assume at zero, then it also gives us some mathematical convenience. We will see that. So at this point, we assume returns is normal. Okay. Um, yeah, so be very, very, very careful. In the question, sometimes when they get, give standard deviation, make sure the standard deviation is for the returns, not for the stock price or change in stock price, right? If, if they give the standard deviation for this, then your equations will be different. We are using this equation. Change in portfolio value is the current stock value times return on that stock. Okay. So if this is normal, then our future is bright because remember what I said, if you, if you have done everything correctly, your delta V would be a linear combination of normal randoms. Here, there is just one normal random. There is, I mean, there are, it's just one, right? And it's just a scaled version of that normal random. S is a scalar, which is being multiplied to a normal random. And so that's, uh, that's, that simply tells us that delta V also will be normal. This is the theorem that we learned in normal distribution, right? Linear combination of normal randoms is another normal. So here is just a scaling, right? So it will be a normal distribution. We need to find out these two guys. And that comes from expectation and variance algebra. Correct? So you guys tell me this. Uh, what is the expected value of delta V? I'll pause here. What is the expected value or the mean of delta V? Wow, all of us saying zero. Awesome. Very simple, right? Expected value of delta V is expected value of S times R. S will come out. It's just scaling. Remember, which is the variable here? The random variable is R. R is normal random. So expected S times expected value of R. Expected value of R is zero. So the mean of PNL, our final portfolio PNL is normally distributed with a mean of zero. On an average, you expect no gain, no loss. Okay. The other guy is comes from variance algebra. What is the variance of delta V? Simple variance of S times R. S will come out as S square times variance of R. Variance of R from the assumption comes uh, is uh, sigma square. Okay. Uh, we have a question, sir. Please repeat mean part. Yeah, sure. So, so look at this expression. We have delta V is equal to S times R, correct? R is normal. Assumption. R is normally distributed. What is S doing here? S is just scaling that normal random. It's not even a full linear combination. There is no combination. It's just one normal random R. S is just scaling it. Okay. So by the properties of normal distribution, we know that the result and delta V will also be normal because it's just scaling the normal random, right? Expectation is, take this expectation, delta V, I'm just, I've just replaced delta V as S times R. R is the normal random. S is the constant scalar that gets multiplied. Okay, so uh, S comes out. Remember the expectation algebra, the constant will come out. Expectation of R, expectation of R is zero because we have assumed the mean of R is zero. So we just replace that here, we get the um, average 
value of the PNL as zero. Did I answer your question? <clears throat> yes, okay, all right. And did you understand the variance part? It is just, uh, you know, same, same uh, stuff that we learned before. The constant comes out as square, so S square times variance of R. Variance of R is sigma square. This comes from the underlying assumption here we have assumed. Okay, so we get S square sigma square. That's it. We got the mean, we got the variance, we know it is normal, our distribution is complete. Once we have the PNL distribution, value at risk is just one step. Uh, you can calculate the sigma also, which will be square root of this. Square root of this is S times sigma. So this S times sigma is the standard deviation of your PNL. Standard deviation of your PNL. And that's what we need. We got the mean, we got the standard deviation. Value at risk is mu plus sigma z, correct? Mu is zero, sigma is s sigma, z is an inverse alpha, whatever alpha is, 1%, 5%, that's up to you, up to the regulator. And that's it. We got the answer. That's the value at risk. <clears throat> okay, now you might think this is probably an overkill for a simple portfolio. We took a long route, but trust me, it is not a long route. These are implicit steps which are not mentioned anywhere clearly. The all of these are in action. One thing leads to another. You get the, get to this final result through this process. I know what we have done so far. I also appeared for FRM, so I also used to do this stock uh, value. Right now, if it let's say hundred dollars, hundred dollars times SD of the returns, it would have been given in the question. Take that and then multiply the, uh, the standard deviate. You get the answer. But there is theory. There is theory behind this. There are proper steps that lead to this equation. Okay. Uh, yeah, I'm just showing where these values are coming from. All we need is the PNL distribution, distribution of delta V, right? Mean comes here, sigma comes here, we get the answer. Uh, this is to tell you that uh, normality in returns, this is our assumption, normality in returns, induced normality in PNL. Okay. This had zero and sigma square as the parameters. In PNL, we got zero and S square sigma square as the parameters. All right. Let's proceed. A uh, couple of more examples and should be good. Two stocks, S1, S2. Two stocks. All right. First equation, V equal to S1 plus S2. Value of the portfolio is sum of value of the two individual stocks. Delta V, how many risk factors are here? There are two risk factors, S1 and S2. So this is a multivariate Taylor series expansion. For each of the input variable, we write it like this. Delta V by Delta S1 times change in S1 plus Delta V times by Delta S2 times change in S, uh, S2. Next, we don't stop here, remember? We will, okay, so before that, delta V by delta S1 is actually very simple. Look at this. What is partial derivative of uh, V with respect to S1? It is one. It is one because S2 is constant, right? So this is one, this is also one. So we get this, delta S1, plus, and this is a trivial result, right? We know that delta V would be equal to delta S1 plus delta S2. Change in value of the portfolio, will come from individual changes in the stock prices. This is a trivial result, but I'm just showing you that through Taylor series also, you get the same, same result. All right. Now we don't stop here. We do this. Multiply S1 divided by S1 so that we express in terms of returns. Delta S1 is S1 R1. Delta S2 is S2 R2. Okay. Now, if you look at this, this how what does this look like? Who can tell me the, the right word that I'm looking for? This on the right hand side, what does this look like? It's a linear combination, exactly. I'm so glad that uh, you could answer this. Exactly. So if you look at R1 and R2, these definitely will assume as normal randoms. 
returns follow normal distribution. And then these are just uh, constant scalars, which are scaling them. And then we're adding it. This is a linear combination. And what do we know about linear combination of two normal randoms? Delta V will also be a normal distribution, right? <clears throat> Assume returns follow normal distributions, zero, sigma one square, R2 follows normal distribution, zero, sigma two square. There are two normal randoms, so we also have to assume a correlation structure. There, is, there, should, there would be some correlation, a row. Okay, we cannot assume they are you know, uncorrelated. By the way, in FRTV standardized approach, they have given everything. You don't have, only thing you have to calculate is the sensitivities of your portfolio. The sigmas and the rows and all those risk weights and everything uh, regulator has prescribed. You just have to plug and play. There's nothing, no big deal. The tricky part is to calculate the sensitivities. Okay. All right. So what to do next? Simple stuff. Expectation of delta V. What is the expectation? Very simple. Look at this. S1 comes out. S2 comes out. The whole thing is still zero because my assumption is that these follow normal distribution with mean zero individually. We put zero here, zero here, you get zero. Still on an average, I expect there will be no gain or no loss. No, no loss. What is uh, variance? We know how to calculate the variance of a linear combination. S1 square, variance of R1, which is sigma one square plus S2 square, remember constant comes out as square, variance of R2, which is sigma two square, plus two times AB, remember, that's two times S1, S2, rho, which is correlation, sigma one times sigma two. This is not a, like a, comes from some thin air. This We have the formula, you always apply that formula. It's a well-established, formula for expectation and variance, use that. Don't have to, you know, re remember thousand different formulas. This is what it is, all right? And then you get sigma, sigma is just the square root of that. So we got everything, we got the mean of delta V, we got the sigma of delta V, then nothing can stop us from calculating the value at risk. That's value at risk because mean is zero. So it's just sigma Z. All good, guys, any questions? So there is a question, uh, will the distribution of Delta V be more dispersed as compared to Delta R? Um, we are not doing Delta R here. We are just taking R as is because returns itself is normally distributed. But uh, yeah, so you're saying since S times sigma would be bigger, standard deviation. Yes, you're correct. The standard deviation in dollar terms, it will be uh, bigger. That is correct. It looks more dispersed, yes. Again, it depends on values of the stocks, but you know, um, considering the value of the stocks would be much higher, right? So it will be, it will have much more dispersion, yes. There is another question. Can this ex be extended to calculate expected shortfall? Um, not exactly, because expected shortfall has a different calculation. This is mostly for uh, value at risk. Um, one thing I have to tell you that uh, if you are doing expected shortfall, we are pretty much not assuming normal distribution because that will defeat the purpose of expected shortfall. The idea of expected shortfall was to do justice to the tail behavior because normal distribution was not enough. Um, right? So we have other approaches uh, for expected shortfall. Yeah, to answer your question, it will um, not help, uh, but still you see the value at risk is still very much useful because um, you still have to calculate value at risk for backtesting purpose. For regulatory capital, you have to use expected shortfall, but for backtesting, you have to still calculate value at risk. <clears throat> okay. And it is also possible to calculate uh, value at risk first in this way, and then multiply some kind of a conservative factor to, uh, you know, approximate the fat tails. So that also, that route also you can take. 
<clears throat> okay. All right, let's proceed. Two more examples, last two examples. Let's say we have a foreign stock. We have a stock, let's say there is a US bank and it has a Euro denominated stock in the books. Then how do we go about it? First step is to express the portfolio value in domestic currency because your PNL will be in domestic currency always, right? So this is the equation. Value of the stock in reporting currency is foreign asset S, whatever it is in Euro terms, times exchange rate. X would be like uh, USD per Euro, right? USD per Euro. So Euro, Euro get canceled, you'll get the answer in terms of USD. All right, value in reporting currency uh, is foreign asset S multiplied by the exchange rate. This is my beautiful function uh, that expresses the value of the portfolio. Now, before I proceed, question, how many risk factors are here? Risk factors are number of random variables which affect your portfolio. Two risk factors, exactly. One is S. S itself can change, right? The stock price itself, although it is denominated in Euro, it can change. And the other aspect is even if the stock price did not change, your exchange rate changed. USD per euro, that value got changed. So either way, it affects your portfolio. Two risk factors, S and X. All right. So what do we do? Delta V. So remember, this is a multivariate uh, function, two, two, uh, two variables, right? So we need to use multivariate Taylor series expansion. For that, we need partial derivatives. What is delta V? Delta V by del S. Delta V by del S would be take X as constant, Del S by del S is one, so it's just X. And the other uh, derivative is with respect to X. Two risk factors, right? One is S, one is X. Delta V by del X is S because you take S as constant and del, del X by del X would be one. So that's how it is. Once you got the partial derivatives with respect to the two uh, risk factors, then you can plug it in using Taylor series. So change in value of my portfolio. Here, my portfolio is just one foreign stock, but it sort of behaves like a portfolio of two different things, right? So this is my expression, right, from Taylor series. So you just plug and play. In place of del V by del, del S, I put X. In place of del V by del X, I put S, I get this. Now, we don't stop here. Remember what I told, right? For FX, for commodity and for equity, expressed in terms of returns. So here we do one more step. Multiply S here, divide S here. Multiply X here, divide X here. So that we get, this is returns on the stock and this is returns on the exchange rate. For all intents and purposes, you can, ex you can pretty much pretend the exchange rate is like a, stock price. Commodity prices, stock prices, exchange rates, they all fit into same class of modeling in, in, um, in quant finance. We use geometric Brownian motion to model all three. Same infrastructure, okay? Uh, the reason is um, all of these have no upper bound, right? They can go up to any extent. Minimum value is zero. Interest rate is another different animal. It is stationary, right? So we have to use other kinds of models. Uh, but anyways, so when dealing with commodity effects and equity, we are looking at returns. And returns are normally distributed. That's our assumption. Okay. So again, how does this look like? This looks like a linear combination, correct? So the ideal approach would be to take expectation, take variance. We have to assume a correlation between RS and RX. That would have been, you know, utopian ideal way. But at this point, regulators do not allow this kind of, you know, diversification between two different risk classes. You pretty much treat this as a standalone equity capital charge. So just treat this as one unit and do your value at risk. Treat this as a separate exercise, calculate value at risk, add those two capitals, that will be your total market risk capital charge. 
So basically, this un is uh, this is um, under equity capital charge, and this goes under forex FX capital charge. So do not put them together, assume correlation, and find out the overall sigma and calculate value. That would have been ideal, but that is not how uh, it works in the current uh, standard. <clears throat> okay, and look at this. The sensitivity is uh, the same portfolio value. Yes, Shivam says the correlation is one. Uh, yes, exactly. If you add those capitals together, you don't get any diversification benefit, which essentially means the correlation is one. Okay, that's the most conservative uh, estimate of capital. But what I wanted to show you is that for both of this, uh, right, the sensitivity is SX, which is the market value of the instrument in reporting currency. For FX also and for equity also, the sensitivity is the market value of the uh, stock in reporting currency. <clears throat> okay. All right. Uh, bond example. For bond, interestingly, we have a ready made formula, this one. Uh, because we have already done, you know, the Taylor series and stuff before to arrive that at that equation. See, this does not appear magically. If you actually take derivative of the present value of the cash flows with respect to the yield, you get duration divided by one plus one times value of the bond, and there will be a minus sign. Try to do that and see for yourself. So we already have this, right? This is the change in yield. I can assume that this is normally distributed and this whole thing appears as a scalar or constant that gets multi multiplied. And then, you know, life is easy, right? Yeah, so <clears throat> normally in practice, we don't use this. There are, uh, so this formula severely approximates that the changes in yield curve are, are uh, flat or parallel. Uh, so we typically take um, multiple list factors on the yield curve for different tenors, and then we calculate something that is called as key rate durations, which is with respect to each and every key rate corresponding to different maturities, and then we put everything together. So it's a little complicated in practice, uh, but uh, you know, for you know, for your exam or um, to understand this, the basics, this this will suffice for now. Okay, so key assumption here is, please understand, look at this, delta y is the one that is normally distributed, not just y. So this is a key mistake that I see people uh, make uh, over and over. So don't do that mistake. <clears throat> All right. Okay. Uh, yeah. So here I am saying again that assuming delta y is normal that induces normality in PNL. Only thing is that the variance will get scaled up by this factor, which is V, see the whole thing is a scalar, right? The whole thing is a constant. V square times modified duration square, right? That becomes the uh, variance of PNL. Once you get the distribution of PNL, you can calculate, I'm assuming from this point, once you get here, you can calculate value at risk. It's just one step. All right. Okay. Last example. I promise this is the last example. So when is all going uh, together? <clears throat> so let's go through this. There is a domestic stock. Domestic stock. So US Bank has a domestic stock that is S1. There is a long call option C with S1 as the underlier. There is a foreign stock S2, which is Euro denominated. Okay. And the, the current exchange rate USD by U, uh, number of US, USD uh, dollars per Euro is X. We also have some Euro cash reserve, just cash, which is uh, in Euros. Let's say N is the, uh, the cash that we have, uh, which is in Euros. And we have a domestic bond B, Assume flat yield curve Y. So we are talking about flat yield curve, parallel change. All right. So we can use the ready-made uh, duration formula. So with all of these going on, how can you calculate parametric value at risk? I think 
without the background, it will be probably practically impossible for you to get the correct answer. Right? But with the five steps approach that we discussed, it all comes naturally. So let's see that. Okay, are you ready for this? Last example, only take five minutes, promise. All right, there are four risk factors. S1, it is the same S1, okay? Please remember within the call option, there are additional parameters like um, volatility and all. We are not taking that in this example, but those are there, okay? Okay, S1, this also has same S1. This has S2 and X. Then we have Euro cash reserve. So this is in, still in Euro, right? So it's not an additional risk factor. We can pretty much work with X. And then we have domain, uh, Y. So there are four risk factors, all right? Value of my portfolio is given by this. Look at this carefully. So S1 plus call option C, Plus, since this is in this is euro denominated, we have S2 times X, correct? In domestic currency terms. Plus, euro cash is a N is the cash amount, which is a constant, by the way. Only thing making it uh, risky is the exchange rate. N times X is the cash reserve in terms of USD. Plus bond. That's all my instruments. Everything reported in domestic currency. Okay, that's my portfolio value in USD. If anything all, you know, anything changes, that will trigger a change in my portfolio. And that's my PNL. And I need to keep capital for the PNL, uh, change in PNL. <clears throat> we use Taylor series expansion. I am only keeping the first order uh, derivatives with its respect to each of these four risk factors with respect to S1, S2, X, and Y. There is nothing outside of this. This is all, correct? Now let's calculate each one of them individually. What is del V by del S1? Look at this. There are two terms which are affected. I mean, will be considered here. All these other terms will, will not, will be treated as constant, right? When we are differentiating with respect to S1, here we'll get a one. Delta C by delta S1, is the delta of the call option. Change in value of the call price with respect to change in underlier, which is S1. That is the delta of the call option. Here in the last three terms, there is no S1. Look, okay, so these will be, these are all just constants with respect to S1. So we get one plus delta of the call option, whatever it is, 0 0.5, 0 0.3, 0 0.9, we don't know. Um, bank will know. <clears throat> okay. Delta V by delta S2. Who can tell me what is the value of this? Take a guess. Differentiate this whole expression with respect to S2. See wherever S2 is and tell me what the answer would be. <clears throat> All of you are saying X. That is correct. There is only one term that has S2. So when you take derivative, X will be a constant, it will come out. Derivative of S2 with respect to S2 is one, so you get X. What about the next term? Who can tell me? So we got one answer, S2 plus N, S2 plus N. That is excellent. We get S2 plus N, correct? Remember a while back, we, I said the sensitivities will get netted for the same risk factor. This is naturally happening here. I don't have to break my head. Like how do I net sensitivities? Although, although in your practical exercise, you will have to net the sensitivities, but the notion of netting naturally comes from this, this uh, set of steps, right? See here, the, the sensitivity of a pure stock is just one with respect to itself, correct? And the sensitivity of the call option is delta. Both got added because of this, you know, if there is something that happens to the stock price, S1, this part, both of these will get affected through their sensitivities, correct? And yeah, so here also we have a netting, correct? 
both of these are foreign denominated uh, assets. So we got a netting uh, here. And uh, del V by del Y, actually there is a correction here. This should be <clears throat> V times uh, modified duration, right? <clears throat> so we have uh, B. Uh, we can write uh, B, D or V. Actually, let me not write V because otherwise I'm using V for portfolio, right? Let's put B here. Okay. All right. Um, yeah. So we got this expression. Now, these are called sensitivities with respect to the four different risk factors. And uh, yeah, so let's plug in these sensitivities into Taylor series expansion. So each of these partial derivatives we replace with the sensitivities. Okay. Now at this point, so there are four random normals and there is a, it's a linear combination of four random normals. I typically you would need a correlation matrix to uh, you know calculate the portfolio level sigma which is the sigma of the PNL and then calculate value at risk. Uh, but as per the market risk standard, we are not allowed to take correlation between cross asset, cross um, asset class, right? So this part, just these two, they will belong to uh, equity risk class. Okay, actually there is one more step. Let me see if I did that or not. Yeah, so remember, we have to, we cannot leave it in this state. We have to take it one more step. So this will be S1 times R1. This will be S2 times R2. Delta X will be X times Rx, right? Returns on exchange rate. And this remains as is. So all of these are normally distributed. Normal, 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 normal. And these are just scalars that get multiplied. So the whole thing is a linear combination. Still, you can proceed in what, uh, in our, how we did it, right? But um, as per the market standard, you're supposed to take, isolate these pieces. This piece will be isolated. It will be capitalized under equity risk capital charge. This piece will be isolated. It will be capitalized under FX capital charge. And this will be within the, we call it as GIRR, general interest rate risk. So we will capitalize under uh, GIRR. All of these individual value at risk will calculate capital charge and add them together. That will give you the total capital charge at the trading book level. Now tell me something. Uh, when I told you in the beginning, if you understand the three formulas properly, everything follows quite naturally. Correct? Initially, this seemed like completely impossible to you know handle with uh, the formulas that we know so far, but with the background, it everything followed quite naturally, right? Would you agree? After today's class, would you ever get scared of parametric value at risk? No matter how complicated the portfolio is. Just do the th three equations, three formulas correctly, understand, do examples, get, master those three uh, formulas and then it will be very easy. And the reason I chose this topic is not just for parametric value at risk. Those three formulas are so, so foundational that you absolutely need them for uh, all your life, actually. Um, there are lots of applications which use those formulas, right? Otherwise, you'll be always handicapped. I can give you 100 questions on time series right now just on those formulas. Okay, and you can answer all those 100 questions with these three formulas, right? So yeah, uh, that's all from my side. I will, so let me leave the, okay. So yeah, here I'm saying that um, with when the number of random normals increase, it's a good idea to use vector and matrices. Uh, yeah, let's not uh, spend time here, but uh, you can find content on this, um, you know, online. If not, then reach out to me. I'll be able to explain. So here are the um, 
contacts we have two youtube channels uh, one is handled by karan one is handled by me uh, and then here are the uh, details of the website uh, you can email us please note down these uh, numbers okay if you have any academic doubts you can call karan sir or me you can email anything about the course uh, or logistics or anything you can call this number all right i don't have anything else uh, hope you enjoyed the session it stretched a little bit but uh, i think uh, i made it worthwhile for you so if you have no questions um, thanks a lot for your time enjoy your weekend thank you bye bye